please stand and sing with us? Good morning, Hope Valley. It's great to see you this morning. Excited to worship together this morning and study the Word. Um, here in a little bit, we are going to uh, share the Lord's Supper together. Um, it doesn't matter if you're a member of our church or not, uh, but it does matter if you're walking in, uh, you profess to know Christ and are walking in fellowship with Him. Um, we invite you to take with us later um, when we do that. Um, let's go to the Lord in a word of prayer. Father, thank you for um, us being able to gather together today. We are so thankful for your word um, and what you've been teaching us. Um, we are thankful for your faithfulness in our lives, um, even in the mundane, even in the, the, the challenges of life. And God, I just ask that uh, your presence uh, would be uh, obvious with us this morning, Lord, that we would be fellowshipping uh, in the spirit um, around the person of Christ. Um, that is why we're here this morning. We are here to collectively worship him. And the burdens that people are carrying this morning, that they would be, just be able to be cast on you. Um, that this whole morning would be a special time for us together. In Jesus' name. Amen. You are good, you are good when there's nothing. dark 
sacrifice that you made for us that we could have a relationship with you that we don't deserve it we didn't earn it but that you freely surrendered your life so that we could have a relationship with you God and I pray if there is somebody in this room today or if there is somebody online who does not know you as their savior that today would be the day that they would surrender their life over to you because you are the best thing the best gift that we could possibly receive and all of the searching will never satisfy unless it's searching for you, God. And I pray all this in your precious name. Amen. Over and over in the Old Testament, God's people promised to be faithful. God gave his law to show what he requires. But again and again, the people failed to obey perfectly. They rebelled and turned against God. Even when they wanted to obey God, they could never be good enough, no matter how hard they tried. Their sin made them guilty before God. They needed help. They needed a savior. At just the right time, God kept his promise to send a savior. Jesus came to rescue sinners. Sin is powerful, but Jesus is more powerful. A believer named Paul wrote about sin in a letter to Christians in Rome. Paul said that Jesus was the savior the people had been waiting for. This is what Paul said. Now there is no condemnation, no judgment or punishment for those who have been saved by faith in Jesus. Why? Because the new law, the law of the spirit, has set you free from the old law. The old law was written down and it helped you understand that you're a sinner. The old law brought sin and death. God sent Jesus to defeat sin and death so that we could be made righteous by faith in him and live through the spirit. God has put the new law right in our hearts. The new law brings life and peace. So Paul talked about two ways of living. Living by doing what our sinful self wants or living by doing what Jesus wants. Since Jesus frees us from the power of sin, we can say no to sin. God gives us his spirit and power to live in a way that honors God. Look, Paul wanted to be clear. Being not guilty before God doesn't mean that we should keep on sinning. God's spirit in us gives us power to turn away from sin and obey God. When we let the Spirit lead us, we prove to be children of God. God doesn't just change something in us. He changes us. God gives us a new heart, new desires, and a new way of thinking. This is a miraculous gift from God. We still struggle with sin, but now what is most true about us is not that we are sinners, but that we belong to Jesus. God sent Jesus to take the punishment our sin deserves. Because of Jesus, we have forgiveness of sins and eternal life. And through God's Spirit, we have the power to turn away from sin and live to bring glory to God. All right, well, good morning. And if you are a guest with us and you would like your kids to go to the kids' ministry, this is the time when all of our kiddos hit downstairs 
um, but you're also welcome to join us and stay up here uh, with us this morning as we uh, spend some time in uh, God's Word. So if you are a guest, again, we want to welcome you. Thank you for being here. Uh, It means a lot that you would spend uh, your Sunday morning with us. And uh, so we're excited to continue to worship the Lord as we walk through the Scriptures together. We're going to start this morning just as in one passage just to to kind of be a launching pad for us, and it's found in the book of Hebrews in the New Testament, Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews 11, and this, I'm just going to read this. We're not going to spend most of our time here, but I want us to, to, to just read and to listen um, to what the New Testament, when it reflects on this event that we're going to be seeing in Genesis this morning. Hebrews 11, verses, uh, beginning in verse 8, it says, By faith Abraham obeyed when he was called out to go to a place that he was to receive as an inheritance. And he went out not knowing where he was going. By faith, he went to live in the land of promise, as in in a foreign land, living in tents with Isaac and Jacob, heirs with him of the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city that that has foundations, whose designer and builder is God. By faith, Sarah herself received power to conceive even when she was past the age, since she was considered him, she, since she considered him faithful, who had promised, therefore from one man and him as good as dead were born descendants, as many as the stars of heaven and as many as the innumerable grains of sand by the seashore. Now go down to verse seventeen. By faith Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac, and he who would receive the promises was in the act of offering up his only son, of whom it is said, through Isaac shall your offspring be named. He considered that God was able even to raise him from the dead, from which, figuratively speaking, he did receive him back. Lord, this morning as we walk through uh, your scripture, and as we think about this incredible event that took place so long ago, and what it, what it represented, and what it pointed to, and what it means for us this morning. It's not just an ancient text that was written so long ago. It's your very word that you have for us. And so, Lord, as we, as we jump into your word, would you take your word, and would you plant it in our hearts so that it would spring forth and produce fruit in the way that we live um, throughout the week. And so, Lord, we, we commit these next moments, uh, Lord, to you. Would you, Holy Spirit, just meet with us? Would you speak to our hearts? in a powerful way. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, you can go ahead and jump back to where we are. We're, we're walking through the book of Genesis. So you might as well jump back there. Uh, and while you're finding your place, um, I don't know about you, but some people have uh, recurring dreams. That's just kind of something that you, you, you have every so often, or maybe it's a recurring nightmare um, where it's something that you just kind of... You go to sleep and, and it comes back again and again. It repeats itself. Some people have uh, a recurring uh, dream of like falling down the stairs. Anybody ever had that before? It's like this thing that happens and there's some kind of psychological meaning behind it. I don't know what it is. Um, but then there's also uh, like a recurring dream where you're standing up giving like a presentation and you realize that you have no clothes on. Like that's a recurring dream that people, that people have. And again, there's, there's meanings and stuff supposedly behind all that. I have one though, um, a recurring nightmare uh, that I've had ever since college, and the nightmare is that I've gotten through the end of the semester, and it's final exam time, and I realized that there was a class that I never went to the entire semester, and now it's final exam time, and I've got to take a test of a class that I never went to. I haven't seen some, apparently that's not just, I'm not the only one. Uh, I think it means that we took school way too seriously uh, and we've got some issues, but um, so the, I have that recurring dream every so often. I wake up in like a panic because I'm, I, I got to take this, this test and I'm not ready for it. Um, maybe you've been there. Maybe you can remember a test that you've had to take in your life that you weren't quite ready for. Or maybe you can just, just imagine this really difficult test. Now we, we have tests in lots of different facets of life. Tests that we uh, that, we, that we encounter, that we have to take, that we have to, that we, there's just no going around them. If you want to drive, you've got to go take a test, right? If you want to, um, you know, you want to go to uh, be a certain profession, there's certain tests that you've got to, that you've got to go through. Spiritually speaking, God uses tests in our lives. There's, there's moments that we're going to go through in life. If you're a follower of Jesus, you're going to have tests in, in your life. 
that the Lord allows, the Lord uses for specific reasons in our lives. Most of us think that we're pretty patient people until we have opportunities in our life that really press against us and really inconvenience us. And then suddenly we realize, well, maybe I'm not as patient. Or, or maybe you just get married and you realize, oh, wait, I'm not as patient and as selfless as I thought that I was. Um, most of us think that we're pretty forgiving people until there's some really difficult, really hard offense that, that takes place in our life, and then suddenly you realize that the resentment that begins to set in, you think, you know what, maybe I'm not as forgiving of a person as I thought that I was. Or, or we think that we're pretty giving people until it actually costs us something, and there's a sacrifice that we have to give up something that we really like, and we'll realize, oh, you know what, maybe I'm not as giving as I, as I thought. And so tests serve to show us something. They, they serve to show us what's going on inside of our hearts. And what we're going to see this morning in Genesis 22 is quite possibly uh, one of the most excruciating, heart-wrenching tests of all time. It's a test that, that God gives to Abraham um, that is going to show him his heart. It's going to be a, a heart-exposing test. And so when we get to Genesis chapter 22, it's where we're going to continue uh, this week, we're going to see the test of faith. And the way that we're going to see this passage is that it's, so again, a lot of Genesis is, is narrative. It tells a story. And so we're going to walk through this story sort of scene by scene uh, and just try to see what it is that, that's happening then and what it means for us um, right now. So Genesis chapter 22, just beginning in verse 1. And after these things, God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, here am I. All right, Paul's there. We haven't gotten very far, but we need to know. This is important. It says, and God tested Abraham. Here's why that's important. This is because what's about to follow doesn't make sense. What's about to follow here is not something that you would ever expect to hear from God asking someone to do something like this. And so what Moses is getting started for us at the very beginning is that, hey, heads up, this is a test. It's not something that God's going to actually require Abraham to do. It's something that is, is going to serve to test his faith and see where his ultimate allegiance lies. So we've got to know that. You can underline that. This is a test from God. So we don't have to spend a bunch of time, you know, apologetically looking into the request that God gives because God has no intention of him actually going through with the sacrifice of his son. He's got a better plan for that, and we'll look at that in a, in a minute. And so you get to this, this, uh, this command that God, that God gives in verse 2. And he said, Take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains, which I shall tell you. All right, so you got this command of God, again, that doesn't make sense and it's not supposed to. Right? It's, a, it's a command that, that if you can only imagine that Abraham receiving this word from God and saying, wait, what? What, what are you talking about? Can you even imagine? And he says, take your, I mean, again, I can only imagine the, the wrestling that he went through with God that night is, no, hang on, I must have misunderstood you because certainly you wouldn't have brought me this far and finally given me a son after this many years and then tell me that I'm supposed to offer him as a sacrifice to you. This does not make sense, God. There's no way that this could possibly be what you're asking me to do. But he's very clear, isn't he? He's, in fact, he says it three times. He says, take your son. It's almost as if he's meeting every objection that, Moses, that, that Abraham would have had. No, 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 you don't understand. This is, this is my son. And he says, I know he's your son. No, no, God, you don't. he's my only son. He's the only son of the promise that you've promised me. I know he's your only son. No, hang, hang on, God. I, he's the son that I adore, that I love. And, it, and it's like the Lord's saying, I know this is the one that you love. So take your son, your only son, the one that you love, and offer him up to me. We don't know exactly what's been going on in Moses' life, I mean, in, in Abraham's life up to this point, other than that God has finally given him his promised son, right? He's finally, he's been waiting for this moment, and now some years have passed, uh, and uh, Isaac is probably in his te early teens or mid-teens, something like that. So Abraham has had all of these years to, to, uh, to be with his, this promised boy, 
And, and, and almost, it's almost as if maybe over these years that Abraham has lost sight of the promise of God and has shifted his focus to the, to the son of the promise. So this, this son has sort of taken his, his heart and taken his, um, his affection on this because if you think about it, that he represented everything to him. And so he was like focused on this son. You know, it's easy for us parents to, um, to lift up children in our lives and they can become little idols in our life. They can become and they can take the place that, that God deserves in our heart above, supremely above everything else. And it's easy, again, for parents to, to kind of elevate our children to that level that they don't belong there. It's very possible that that's what's happening here with, with Abraham. And so God gives him this command. So now, next point is that God is that Abraham has a choice, doesn't he? There's a command, and now there is a choice. What is he going to do? And you see in verses um, 3, So Abraham rose early in the morning. He saddled his donkey, and he took two of his young men with him and his, and his son Isaac. And he cut the wood for the burnt offering and rose and went to the place which God had told him. And on the third day, Abraham lifted his eyes and saw the place from afar. Now, we don't see, uh, we don't see the, really any hesitation at all. We're not, we're not told if there was any wrestling or battling along with the Lord. All we know is that he woke up in the morning and he obeyed. So he had a choice to make. I can either obey what God has said or not. I can believe the promises of God or not. He had a choice to make, and so do we. You see, we have a choice every single day of our life. I'm either going to follow God and obey his word, or I'm not. There's no middle ground. There's no wishy-washy. There's no, there's, there's no middle area there where I can just kind of hang out in. It's either I'm going to listen and follow, or, or I'm not. So he had a choice to make, and oftentimes we... With our mouths, we might make the we might make the choice. Hey, I'm, I'm yeah, I'm going to follow after the Lord. But what about in our actions? Do we actually functionally live that out in our lives every single day? But Abraham rises early in the morning and he goes. So he's made his decision, hasn't he? He's made his decision. I'm I'm going to go. And so he takes the things that he needs to make an offering. He he takes the 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 wood. He gathers it. He gets his servants and he gets his son and he heads to the place he didn't even know where he's going yet he just knows God has told him to go and so he says okay well I'm going to go I, I can only imagine the what ifs that were going through his mind we're not told what they are but there, there had to have been some there had to have been okay I, I just doesn't make sense I, I'm going and I'm obeying and I'm listening but I don't see where you're heading me I don't see where you're leading me Lord like I like I really, this is not making any sense to me. But we're finding in the book of Hebrews that there is something that he's thinking about in there. And that is, okay, yes, this doesn't make sense. Yes, I can't imagine how hard this is going to be. But I know the one who is sending me. And I know what he could do. And so he reasoned in his heart, you know what? If the Lord's going to offer, have me then offer my son Isaac, then he's going to have to raise him from the dead because he has promised he has promised what he was going to do through Isaac, not somebody else. And so he had to trust in that moment that my God can raise the dead, right? So if he has me all for my son, then he must have a plan to raise him from the dead. And that's sort of what he was resting in and leaning on as he followed in this step of obedience. Me and some men in the church, we've been walking through a, a book from Alistair Begg, and um, it's walking through the book of Daniel and talking about the, the faith that God uh, grew and established and used in the life of Daniel and, and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And we were walking through that this week, kind of just talking through it together as, as brothers. And, and, um, and just, I was amazed and struck by something that, um, that, uh, that was in the book. And this is the quote. And it says that faith is not believing in spite of evidence. Rather, it's obeying in spite of the consequences. So think about that for a moment. It's not just like believing in spite of evidence, but it's obeying no matter the consequences. So I'm going to obey no matter what comes next. And that's, and that's what's so incredible in this story. And I, this is one of my favorite stories in the scriptures because you see Abraham, 
And then the next thing, so this, there's, a, there's, a, there's a call, I mean, there's, a, there's a command of God, and there's a choice, but then there's also confidence. And this is incredible. What I love is the incredible confidence that he has in the power of God. And so if you look over in, uh, in verse 5, look at 5 through 10, it says, And then Abraham said to his young men, Stay here with the donkey, and I and the boy will go over there, and we will worship, and we will come back. He's got some sort of assurance, he's got some confidence in the Lord that, listen, I don't know how, but I know that we're going to both be coming back. And so uh, it says, and then Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and he laid it on Isaac, his son, and he took in his hand the fire and the knife and they went, both of them, together. And Isaac said to his father, Abraham, my father, he said, uh, he, he said, here I am, my son. He said, behold, the fire and the wood are, are here, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? And Abraham said, God will provide for himself the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. And so they both of them went together. When they came to the place which God had told them, Abraham built the altar there and laid the wood in order, and he bound Isaac, his son, and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then Abraham reached out his hand and took the knife to slaughter his son. Holy cow. I mean, can you, can you imagine? Can you imagine that moment? And as a dad, that's really hard to, 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 to wrap my mind around. But Abraham knew. He knew who he was serving. He knew the one who had asked him to do this. And so here's what he's saying. Like, God, I don't know how you're going to do this. I don't know when you're going to do this, but I know that you're going to do this. Because our God is faithful to his promises, and he always does what he says he's going to do. And so Abraham says, okay, so God, I'm all in here. Like, I'm, I'm here. There, I, I'm bringing up to this last possible moment. And Lord, I don't know how you're going to do it, but I know that you're going to do it. Do we have that sort of confidence in the Lord? with our lives, with our children, with our job, with our marriage, with, with everything. Say, Lord, like, I don't know how you're going to do this, but I know that you're going to do it. Uh, I, I don't know why you allow the things that you allow in my life, but I know that you're not going to leave me and you're never going to forsake me. I don't know how you're going to take this awful situation and work it out for my good, but I know that you're going to because you've told me that you will. And so have we gotten to that point where we say, okay, Lord, I just trust you because we know the one that we're talking to have you heard the name george mueller george mueller was a a missionary evangelist uh, cared for uh thousands and thousands of orphans in england in the 1800s um he, he's there's some fascinating books that are out about his life and tell his story uh and i'd encourage you sometime to to check them out but george mueller was uh, known for his care of thousands of orphans, children. And he had a conviction in his heart, and that's, this was the conviction. I'm never going to ask anybody for a cent. I'm going to trust God for the daily provisions for these children every single, every single day. What's incredible is that he took detailed notes in his journal of the faithfulness of God to answer prayer. In fact, he's got a, he's got a prayer journal that, that chronicles 50,000 answers to prayer that God, that God did throughout, the, throughout those, those years. 50,000 specific answers to prayer, and he, and he journaled every single one of those. One of the ones that he tells was there was a morning when he was with the children, and, and the food had run out. Pantry was empty. There's no food in sight. There's nothing there for them. And so he gathered the kids around. This is, this is incredible, incredible faith. He gathered all the children around, and he said, okay, um, I know the pantries are empty. There's nothing here for us, but uh, we're going to pray. And, and so he gathered me. He said, Lord, we want to thank you for the food that we know you're going to provide for us to eat. He says in his journal, he says, at that, at that time, um, uh, there was a knock came at the door, and there was a, a local baker who the Lord had woken him up at 2 in the morning and said, just felt impressed that he needed to bake bread for the orphanage. And so he said, here, there, I don't know why, but the Lord just told me that you guys needed bread today. 
And so he brought the bread in there and, of course, told the children and said, gave glory and honor to the Lord Jesus for providing in that specific moment. He said, we had just gotten done praying and thanking the Lord for the bread when a knock came at the door. And there was a milkman who came to the front door and said, um, my, my cart has broken down right in front of your orphanage. And um, I'd like to offload all of this milk, if possible, so we could fix the cart. Would, you, would, would y'all need some milk? And, and so he just laughed as he told these stories of, of just the faithfulness of God, moment by moment, step by step, in his, in his life. He had a confidence, and he had a faith in the Lord that he didn't know when, he didn't know how, but he knew that God was going to provide for his needs. Now, we see this in the scriptures as well. We see, we see stories, and we see... Um, this played out in, in multiple different ways where people have confidence in the Lord. I told you about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. We've been reading this story at, in our men's group. And if you guys remember the story, so Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are, are there living in Babylon, and the king erects this 90-foot-high uh, uh, statue and says, Now, everybody in the nation, everybody, when you hear the, the sound of the, of the instruments, you must bow down and worship the statue. Well, that time comes, and, and the, the, the cry goes out, and everybody bows except for three Hebrew children, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and they don't bow. And so they're brought before the king, and, and they say, you know, hey, these, these boys are not bowing when everybody else, when you're called them to bow. And so the king says, all right, here you go, one more shot. When the music plays, you must bow. And listen, if you guys remember the story, um, they look up at the king and they say, listen, um, our God is able to deliver us from your hand. But even if he doesn't, we will burn before we bow. That was the, that was the confidence that they had in the face of, and, and, but here's what's, here's what's crazy, what happened? So they did not bow, and so they gathered them and they threw them in the fiery furnace but there was somebody in the furnace already waiting for them, wasn't there? And the Lord was already there, ready to welcome them. And then they were not burnt up. Uh, we love, we talked about this this week, about how they didn't even smell like, you know, like, like anything, like burnt anything. They were just, like the Lord delivered and rescued them out of that, that trial in that furnace in that moment. And God gets all the glory for that. But that's not, the, they're not all the stories don't end that way, right? So if you think about in the New Testament, we have people that express this confidence in the Lord. There's a man named Stephen, and he was a, a passionate follower of Jesus, and the Lord granted him boldness to proclaim uh, the, the gospel of Jesus in front of, 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 of all the people that were, that were there. There was a moment when we see in the book of Acts where he's arrested, and he's brought before this council, and they, they present him. They say, Here, here's all, is, are these things true? Are you saying these things? And and, and amidst all the accusations, and, and as they have him arrested, he's sitting there before the, the, the council, and he just begins to preach the gospel right there in front of, his, in front of all of these opposers. And what's incredible in that passage, in fact, let me just, let me just read it for you really quick. So uh, in um, Acts chapter 7 is where we see this passage, this really awesome, like this boldness that God gives Stephen. The, he's just now completed sharing the gospel with them and explaining who Jesus is and what he did. And it says in verse 54, And now when they heard these things, they were enraged, and they ground their teeth at him. But he, full of the Spirit, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And he said, Behold, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. And they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears, and they rushed together at him. And they cast him out of the city, and they stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their garments at the feet of a young man named Saul. And as they were stoning Stephen, he called out, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And falling to his knees, he cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And when they, he had said this, he fell asleep. So you have this incredible confidence in God where he says, like, I'm going to obey the Lord no matter the consequences. Now, the ending was different, but the confidence was the same, right? In that moment, the Lord still received the glory. God was still honored among the, the people and among the nations. And his name still went forward, even though the story had a different type 
of ending. Because faith is not believing in spite of evidence, rather it's obeying in spite of the consequences. Are we willing to follow Jesus, to trust him, no matter what may come? No matter what consequences may, may come our way? Well, Abraham has made his decision, and he has chosen to follow in obedience to God, and he places his son and lays the wood on him, or lays him on the wood to slaughter his son. I, I can't imagine. I can't imagine that, that moment. The tears, the, the anguish, the, the trembling hands as he held the knife. And as he raises his arms to sacrifice his son, then we get the call in that moment when he says, Abraham, Abraham, verse 11 he says, here I am. And he said, do not lay a hand on the boy or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God, seeing that you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. The Lord stopped him in that moment. Now listen, this is not a moment where God learned that he was going to be faithful. It's just a proclamation of, the, of that he passed the test. Right? He, he passed the test that God had placed before him. It was now very clear and very evident where his heart was. Um. I love the way that A.W. Tozer um, describes this event in The Pursuit of God. He describes what's going on here. Um, I'm just going to read it. Is that all right? Just, just listen to this description of what's happening here in this moment. It says, Isaac represented everything sacred to his father's heart. The promises of God, the covenants, the hopes of the years and the long messianic dream. As he watched him grow from babyhood to young manhood, the heart of this old man was knit closer and closer with the life of his son, until at last the relationship bordered upon idolatry. It was then that God stepped in to save both the father and son from the consequences of an uncleansed love. Take thy son, thine only son Isaac, whom thou lovest, to the land of Moriah, and offer him there. We can only imagine the agony of that night as he wrestled with his God. How should he slay the lad? Even if he could get the consent of his wounded and protesting heart, how could he reconcile the act with the promise, In Isaac shall thy seed be called? This was Abraham's trial by fire, and he did not fail in the crucible. While the stars still shone like sharp white points above the tent where the sleeping Isaac lay, and long before the gray dawn had begun to lighten the east, the old saint had made up his mind. He would offer his son as God had directed him to do, and then trust God to raise him from the dead. God let the suffering old man go through with it up to the point where he knew there would be no retreat. And then he forbade him to lay a hand on the boy. To the wandering and confused patriarch, he now says into effect, It's okay, Abraham. I never intended on you that you should actually slay the lad. I only wanted to remove him from the temple of your heart so that I might reign unchallenged there. So that moment has come, and he's passed the test. He had this call of God. Now, that could be the end of the story, couldn't it? It technically could end right there. All right, Abraham, you passed your test. Here's your son. Let's go back home. But God's not done yet. God's not done yet. He's still doing something. There's something else here that, that God is doing. So then you get to verse 11. Uh, or you get to verse uh, 12 and 13. It says, and, and Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, and behind him was a ram caught in a thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered it as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called the, place of the, called the name of that place, the Lord will provide. And it is said to this day, on the mountain of the Lord, it shall be provided. And the angel of the Lord called to Abram a second time from heaven and said, By myself I have sworn, declares the Lord, because you have done this and have not withheld your son, your only son, I will surely bless you. I will surely multiply your offspring as the stars of the heavens and as the sand that is on the seashore. And your offspring shall possess the gate of his enemies. And in your offspring shall all the nations of the earth be blessed, because you have obeyed my voice. So Abraham returned to his young men, 
And they arose and went together to Beersheba. And Abraham lived at Beersheba. Can you imagine that journey home? Abraham and Isaac, arm in arm, walking back down the mountain. Can you imagine what that would have been like? Like, like just talking about the faithfulness of God. Like, you, you, see, what, you see how God provided? You see, you see, here's the problem. Is that in that moment, Abraham needed something. He needed a substitute. He needed someone to step in. You see, when he said, God will provide for himself an offering. He didn't realize exactly what he was saying in that moment, that God had already prepared and already set in place that there was going to be something that was going to take the place of his son. He needed a substitute. Now listen, you cannot read this passage and miss the connection to Jesus. You cannot look at all of the events that led up to this moment and forget what this is ultimately foreshadowing and pointing to. So, th so think about several things. First of all, think about the son. Who is the son? His son Isaac, the one that, that ultimately is going to, he says that through Isaac, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. So there is a, there is a coming blessing that's going to happen as a result of this, uh, of this son Isaac. So God is going to bless the nations. And what we know is that later on, if you look at the book of Matthew, it says, you know, and Abraham had Isaac, and Isaac had Jacob. And it goes through all this genealogy. And then it gets to the point where it says, and through this seed comes King David. And then through this seed ultimately comes King Jesus. So we know that through this son, there's going to come someone else. So don't, don't miss the significance of who this son is. He takes the wood and he lays it on the son. Right? As he carries it up the mountain, in the same way this wooden cross was laid on the sun, that he then carried up the mountain. The same mountain, by the way, Mount Moriah, where the temple would later, a thousand years later, be built. Like the temple where all of the sacrifices would be made to the Lord on behalf of the people was going to be built on this exact spot where the sun carried the wood. And so then we see later on that Jesus carries the cross to the place where he's ultimately going to be crucified. And then we have a substitute. And that is that God makes a provision. But here's what's so crazy. When Abraham said God will provide for himself a substitute, you know what was going to happen? Is that God was going to provide himself as the substitute. Like no other religion on the face of the earth do we come anywhere close to the God of heaven stepping out of heaven and becoming the substitute for sin? Only here do we have God giving up his life for the sake of the lost. He provided himself. In theology, uh, we call this the, the penal substitutionary atonement. All right, and I don't just say that for fun. It's important. It's important to think through that. What does that mean, that, that he is the, the penal substitutionary atonement? Well, it means that, that Jesus Christ, listen, don't, forget, don't, don't miss this, that Jesus Christ took the full punishment that we deserved for our sins as a substitute in our place. All right, let's, let's think, say that again. Jesus took the punishment that we deserved for our sins as a substitute in our place. That means that he died the death that we were supposed to die. He paid for the sins that we were supposed to pay for. He did that for us in our place. We see this beautifully in so many places in Scripture, but in Romans chapter 3, just briefly, Romans 3, look at verse 21, and it says, And now the righteousness of God has been manifest apart from the law, although the prophets and the law bear witness to it, the righteousness of God through faith in Christ Jesus for all who believe. For there is no distinction, for all have sinned. Everybody has sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And we are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, who God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. And this was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance had passed over former sins. 
What this means is that he has, he has taken Jesus, that, that God gave Jesus as the propitiation. That means the, the one that satisfies the wrath of God that, again, we deserve. And so instead, he takes that place so that he absorbs it and that he receives it, the pain and the, the suffering and the wrath and the justice of God that we ultimately deserved. He took our place. So we would see in 1 Peter 2.24 that he himself bore our sins on his body on the cross so that we might die to sin and live for righteousness. By his wounds we have been healed. That's what it means when we say that Jesus is our substitute. It's not, it's not, it's not uh, light. It's not something that we should just brush over. It's something that we should just like try to sit in for a moment. This is what I deserved. We just sang about it a minute ago, but it's not what I got. You know, I, I like to read, um, uh, not all the time, um, but I like to go back and read some of the early church fathers as they think through and wrestle through, um, you know, in, in some of the first century writers, first, second, third century writers, as they wrestled with, okay, so who is Jesus? What does this mean for us? Like, what is, the, what is going on here? And, and I love how they, how they wrestled through things and, and as they tried to talk with one another and, and truly understand there's a, one of the earliest manuscripts that we have uh, that's, that's still in existence today uh, from the second century is, is what is called, just known as the, the letter to Diognetius. And in this letter, it's, a, it's some kind of contemporary of the apostles who's writing to someone um, named, named Diognetus, and he's explaining who Jesus is. Like, he's explaining, this is who Jesus is, and this is what he does, and this is what he accomplished for us. I love that. Listen to these words. He says, for what else was able to cover our sins except the righteousness of that one in whom it was possible for us, the lawless and ungodly, to be justified except in the Son of God alone. All the sweet exchange, all the inscrutable work of God, all the unexpected benefits of God, that the, the lawlessness of many might be hidden in one righteous man, while the righteousness of the one might justify many lawless men. You see, so many years ago, they were understanding what it, the implications of what it means that Jesus Christ is the substitute for you and me. What does that mean? That means, church, that the only way that we can be saved, the only reason that we can be saved is because Jesus Christ took our place. And that salvation is only found in him. And there is forgiveness and there is redemption because of what Jesus has done. That's going to transition us as we think about this time of, of communion. Because when we come to the table and we do this, like this, it's not something that we do lightly. It's something that we need to reflect on and think through and, and be thankful over what God has done for us. Worship team, you guys come on up for a minute. Church, if you just take a moment just to be in an attitude of prayer, uh, go ahead and close your eyes. And pray. Just, just as you pray in your own heart before the Lord. Here's what I want you to think through right now. We're going to sing a song in just a minute. It's just called the Lamb of God. And the words are super simple. But it just says, the Lamb of God in my place. Your blood poured out, my sin erased. It was my death that you died. And that's what we're going to sing together. And maybe you want to take a moment and just reflect on those words um, as, as, we, as the worship team leads us. Um, or maybe this morning, um, maybe you don't even know where you are. Maybe this morning is a time when I, I, you'd say, you know what? I, I'm not saved. I'm not. I, I, I want the substitute. I, I want Jesus' life that he gave for me, like, I want his sacrifice to cover my sins. And that can happen right now this morning. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to be down here. Um, and as we sing this song, 
Um, we're going we're gonna to stand and we're going to sing, or you can sit and you can sing. We're going to have this time of reflection. But if that's you this morning and you say, I, I know that I need to be saved, I'm going to ask you to be bold enough in a moment to just come and, and see me right here in the front. It doesn't matter who sees you. It doesn't matter what's going on in the, you know, the internal you know, you know, wrestle you might be having in your own heart. I'm just going to say, just, just come. Just come. And I would love to sit down here, right here, and just explain to you and show you, walk with you, how you can pray and repent and follow after Jesus. So, Lord, right now, as we come in this holy moment, as we come before you, and before we, before we come to your table to remember and reflect on your sacrifice for us, Lord, maybe there's someone right now, here in this moment, this needs to be the time that they surrender their life to you once and for all, nailing down that their sins are covered by your sacrifice. So, Lord, would you give them the boldness, Holy Spirit, would you draw their hearts to you as only you can do? Lord, would you let us rest this morning in faith and trust, no matter what the consequences may be. God, would you, would you work in our midst? Would you work in our church? Would you draw our hearts to you? In Jesus' name, amen. You reflect, sing together. And if you want to come, we'll be right here. Your blood poured out.
would you would you stand for a moment? Everybody just stand up. We're going to take this next moment, um, and we're going to reflect on the life and the death and the sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross. That's what we, when we come to the table to take the uh, the communion, it's that it's a time to remember. Um, it's also a time to examine our own hearts before the Lord, to make sure there's no unconfessed sin in our lives. There's no uh, there, there's no relationship that we've um, that we've left broken. There's 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 nothing in our heart that would prevent us from um, from gazing upon the face of the Lord as we as we do this. And so, would you take a moment just in your own heart just to pray before the Lord? Again, we're going to invite you in just a moment. We're going to all step forward. We're going to take, come through and grab your bread and grab your juice and make your way back to your seat. Um, and we invite you, even if you're a guest with us, if you're a follower of Jesus, we, we hope that you'll join us in this, in this time. And if you're not yet a follower of Jesus, that you would just watch and, and see and reflect on what this means and why we do this. So take a, take a moment. Um, Brother Creed, you can come on up here. And uh, take a moment and just... Spend some time in your own heart just to, to seek the Lord. Just a second. You guys come on up. You can take just a, any row you like. Just come on up here. Grab your um, the juice and the bread and then make your way back to your seat.
So the Lord Jesus took some bread and he broke it and he gave thanks to the Lord. And so we do the same. We thank the Lord for his body. Lord, thank you for being the, um, the God who created everything, knows everything, and, and, and is everything. Thank you for your son, Jesus, and his body that, that this blood stand, that this bread stands for. Thank you for seeing that we couldn't do it, mm. and a sacrifice was needed. And Lord, that it had to be your son who gave his body. That, that tells us how big our sin is, but more it tells us how big your love for us is. And we thank you for that. Um, I ask that you'd make us mindful of how great your love is, how great the sacrifice was, and that um, sure that we'd, we'd receive this bread, but that we would more that we'd receive your sacrifice. Thank you, in Jesus' name. And Jesus took the cup. This cup is the new covenant in my blood for the remission of sins. So we're so thankful for the blood of Christ. Father, we thank you for the blood, even on that day on Mount Moriah, that Abraham went through and offered that ram as a worship offering for you. And then later we say all the, the types of in the sacrificial system and so many thousands upon thousands of lambs and doves and calves that were slain and they were really just foreshadows cheap imitations of what really was to come and we thank you for Christ and thank you that he went to the cross dying in our place um Pouring out that shared experience, taking on human flesh and blood, and pouring out his life for us. It really is the only blood that's ever mattered. Mm. And we are thankful for it, Lord. And we look back and, and remember it today, even while we're considering the time that you're going to come back and we'll be with you. Lord, thank you for that blood. Thank you that it covers our sin. Mm. Thank you that it brings us together into fellowship with you and fellowship with one another. In Jesus' name, amen. And Lord Jesus, we love you. We do this as an, all, as an act of worship, surrendering our lives to you. We're thankful for your sacrifice for us on the cross. But we also thank you and rejoice in your resurrection and how you conquered death and sin and the grave and all the powers that stood opposed to us. You took them away, nailing them to the cross. So we thank you, Jesus, for your victory that we have and the victory that we can have in you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Kevin, take it away. It is so nice to be able to um, participate in the Lord's Supper with with each and every one of you, we love and appreciate you um, and our church family. And we're excited about everything that the, the Lord is doing, um, even as we're starting to think about Easter already. February is almost behind us, and um, we're thankful for what Christ has done. Uh, some things that we are looking forward to that are on the church calendar. 
Um, uh, we have men's breakfast that's going to be on March 11th, uh, 9 a.m. Hope you men can make it that day. Uh, the following day on that Sunday, we're going to have a safety team meeting for all those who serve on the safety team, and we'll provide lunch for you guys uh, on that day. Um, I think last week we said the 5th, but we're actually going to change that to the, the 12th, so just keep that in mind. And then looking ahead, March 25th at 1 o'clock, uh, we're going to have church outreach day. Uh, we're even going to have some, some folks from out of town that are going to be helping us uh, organize that for that day and uh, hope that you can set that day aside as we reach out uh, to our community, invite people um, for Easter, and uh, just make much about Christ with, with one another. And let's see, I think that's all that we really need to mention today. Um, and of course, you can find uh, all these things, all the details and more uh, on the church app. But would you stand back to your feet? back to your feet. Father, we thank you again for allowing us to be here today, um, and thank you for Christ, and um, you know, we're not worthy of, of the sacrifice that he gave for us, but nevertheless, in your love, um, we, we cling to, to what you've done on our behalf, and that's the only plea that we have for, in Jesus' name, amen. Between us, lies across you.